There's so many individuals out there that are so talented in different things that never accomplish anything. Okay, the world is filled with talented people. You know a lot of them yourselves. Okay, and they never accomplish anything. With talent has to come preparation, has to come action, has to come development of being able to take those talents, take those skills, continue to develop them, continue to sharpen them physically, continue to sharpen them mentally, because at some point, your physical talent is going to diminish as a professional athlete. That's just a fact. Don't forget to pray. But don't be ashamed to pray. And don't be too proud to pray. Because prayer, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. I don't care how dark it looks for you. I don't care what, what they just said to you. I don't care what the verdict is. I don't care what the haters say. Prayer changed things. I'm talking to a girl that I grew up on the block, man, but it didn't breed success. A lot of people on our block ain't here no more. Man. I grew up in a place, man, that was, you had to be something else you come up out of there. Prayer changes things. I was told I would never be nothing. Prayer changes things. I flunked out of school. Prayer changes things. I'm on my third marriage, lost everything I've owned twice. I've been homeless and lived in a car for three years. Prayer changes things. The cool thing about prayer is the one thing that's available to everybody at any given time. Do you know that God ain't ever too, he ain't ever too busy for you? You know that God actually knows who you are? Do you know that God actually created you to converse with him? Do you know that God would actually love to hear from you? Do you know that I like talking to him even when I don't really need nothing? Quit playing with this here. You're not gonna make it without God. If you've tried it so far, tell me how that's working out for you. It suck, don't it? You need God. Don't, don't you think I got here without him. I've needed him every step of the way. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't even be standing here today. Quit being ashamed about it and worrying about who looking. Go somewhere by yourself today and tell God you need some help. Tell him that you're just tired of trying to figure it out for yourself. You can't be tripping with my walk with him because my path ain't been like yours. This is my version of being saved. All you got to do is get your own version. You ain't got to change, God work with you. God take anybody that want to be saved and he saved. So just like old people used to say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody. And as you begin to challenge yourself, you'll discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. The other thing is you begin to look at yourself, look at your dreams and, and, and begin, begin to experiment and stepping into your greatness. One of the things that's very important, whatever goals and dreams that you have, repeat after me please, make your move before you're ready. You have Price Pritchard, who's a great, great motivator and, and, and trainer. He said, make your move before you're ready. We're in, instructed in, in life to walk by faith and not by sight. See, you want to really begin to stretch yourself. You want to become a risk taker. You want to raise the bar on yourself. Most people won't do that. See, most people engage in low life living, low risk living. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. And if you cannot become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there?
I like what Helen Keller said. Life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. And so you want to begin to take some chances. You want to begin to challenge yourself and make it okay to fail and learn from your failures. Don't allow fear of failure and the, the, the allure, the attractiveness of playing it safe in life to draw you in. You can't get out of life alive. You got to die to leave here. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health, my wealth. What am I not doing I'm neglecting that would be easy to do? Let's go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on the public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean that up, and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionize your life if you haven't picked it up late. Guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot, heading for happy hour. Stretches his break, comes early for lunch, late back from lunch, company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay. Little does he know the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on your philosophy, your attitude, and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. One of my key phrases for the whole day, disciplines work miracles. Disciplines work miracles. Take a deep breath and be patient. Calm down, go slow. Don't let other people's negativity or anger or frustration affect you. Step back in your own mind mentally and just smile. You know, there's an old saying, if you, don't, if, if you can't say something nice, don't talk at all, is my advice. Sometimes the very best thing you can do in dealing with difficult people is just to be dead silent. Don't feed the fire by arguing or getting involved. When you're dealing with a difficult person, just stop the clock like a timeout, just smile and don't say anything. And then when you do say something, remember one of the great communication tools is this, is the person who asks questions has control. The way that you can take control of any negative situation is not trying to win, but simply by asking questions. Say, you know, wh why do you say that? Or why do you feel that way? Or uh, that's an interesting point of view. Uh, how did you come to that point of view? Or, or uh, how would we know that what you say is true? I mean, is there any uh, proof or validity? Instead of attacking, simply ask questions. And it's sort of like the matador backs away from the bull. As you keep backing away from the bull, you cape the difficult person by simply asking questions and being genuinely curious about what he or she is thinking and feeling and why they are behaving the way they are. Sometimes you may find that they have a good reason. 
Sometimes you may find that they misunderstand something. Maybe you will find that they have a difficult problem in their lives. But in any case, be calm, be patient, be controlled, and ask questions, and it will make you the master of the situation. I went to Kent State, I dropped out. I, well, I didn't drop out, I flunked out. Now that threw my life into a spiral, but because I didn't have a college degree, I could not let that stop me. And like you're doing, where you're saying, all my friends at this age are settled in your careers, you don't even know if they're happy or not. Stop comparing yourself to others. So the first thing you do is stop focusing on other people. Instead, focus on being the best version of you that you can. Then you'll recognize that you deserve to sit at the big table with everybody else after you become the best that you can be. And here's the first piece that works miracles. Number one, do what you can. Do not let neglect grab you by the throat. Don't let neglect stall you on your path toward prosperity and health, being able to become powerful, influential, rich beyond wildest imagination. Don't neglect what you can do. If you can read, read. If you can change, change. If you can grow, grow. If you can take one step, take one step. Do not neglect to do whatever you can do at the moment. Of course you can't run a multi-billion dollar business today. Mark couldn't either 10 years ago. Mark couldn't either five years ago. But I'm telling you today he can do it because step by step, year by year, he took on what he could do. He didn't neglect it. He did the meetings he could do. He made the calls he could make. He read the books he could read. He took the classes he could take. And step by step, he got himself ready. I'm telling you, do not neglect to do whatever you can do because it'll work miracles of personal development first productivity second now do what you can here's number two do the best you can if it's a foggy night and you can only see 100 feet how can you see another 100 feet answer walk the first 100 feet walk as far as you can see and then you can see some more and walk as far as you can see and then you can see some more so what you've picked up here just do it as far as you can see it and i promise you if you'll execute as far as you can see it you'll be able to see more do that then you can see more and finally get in tune of doing the best you can and you'll have the activity that'll develop the disciplines that will set this sail so that you can say it doesn't matter how the wind blows. I'm prepared. Now here's the last clue on discipline. Do the best you can. We covered earlier, but here's a good scenario for the do the best you can. I've got a good question for you. Is the best you can do all you can do? And the answer is no. Strangely enough, if we all fell on the floor right now and did as many push-ups as we possibly could, and let's say for some reason you haven't been into push-ups lately, I can't imagine why, but let's say... And let's say the best you can do is five. And you look up at the rest of us and say, hey, five is the best I can do. We can tell by the look on your face, that's probably true. Five is the best you can do. Now is five all you can do? The answer is no. If you rest a little, you can do five more. Wow. And if you rest a little, you can do five more. And if you rest a little, you can do 15 more. How did we get from five to 15? It's a miracle. And if you rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 20. How did you get from five to 20? It's a miracle. Did you know you can keep doing that? Do a little more, rest a little, do a little more, rest a little, and finally get up to 50 push-ups? Is it possible to get up to 50 push-ups? Of course. How do you go from five to 50? It's a miracle. How do you get a miracle going? Number one, do what you can. Don't leave out what you can from writing a letter to your mother in Florida. Start cleaning it all up. Two, doing the push ups. Go from five to 50. It's a miracle. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here's number three, rest very little. 
Here's the clue. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to act. Think of more disciplines. Think of more ways and means in which to use your own wisdom and your own philosophy and use your own attitude, your own faith, your own courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of discipline. Thereby transform your life. You have something that you brought to the universe and that if you decide that my life deserves my developing this what I do well and becoming the best at it and mastering myself and seeing what I have within me. The secret though, the secret to real success is if you tie your gift to the dream. Once you've accepted that you have as much right to success and much right to succeed as anybody else, the next step is learning how to talk the talk. You have to get fluid in the language of success so you speak it with ease. Surround yourself with people who've accomplished their dreams and immerse yourself in the culture of achievement. Your gifts can take you many places if you develop your gifts. Never forget, what comes easy won't last. And the things that last the longest never come easy. And that's the exact reason why. The harder you work for something, the greater you feel when you achieve. If you decide to drop your buckets where you are and develop your gifts, I grant you, you'll never ever be without. I grant you that your gifts will take you places that will literally amaze you. I grant you that if you begin to work to develop your gifts, you'll develop a strong sense of happiness. You'll get a larger vision of yourself because part of beginning to get a larger vision of yourself, all of us need some area of our lives where we can have a feeling of competence. That people know when they think about this area, that's something you do. That you eat and sleep that. And that you do that, you do that. Develop the ability to act, take action. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. You say, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you gotta do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto, action immediate, action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold. A year from now, can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. It's right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, gotta take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity. Capture. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. Now, here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Okay. We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. Key to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. 
If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal and you won't take pictures and you won't do this, you won't do wise things with your money, you won't do wise things with your time, you won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Key. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. One neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline. Okay? Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited, you'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The disciplines to do, it, take action. A wise person once told me, dreams don't work unless you do. We try so hard in our lives to fit in. We try to fit into certain groups, certain frats, certain sororities, you know, among certain friends. Yet the people we idolize are most are the ones that stand out. But when you're prepared, there is no fear. There is no fear of failure because even if you've walked out of something and you feel like you failed at it, 
your preparation is so strong that you're gonna take that failure and turn it into the outcome you desire. And most people stop at failure, okay? We've all failed at things. I'm gonna continue to fail at stuff, right? It's the most powerful tool you can use, but it all depends on how you use it. Many things used to puzzle me back in those early days. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company, one make twice as much money. Now see, that used to puzzle me. And maybe they were the same age, graduated from the same school, live in the same community, work for the same company, with the same products and the same services. They've got the same traffic, the same problems, and one makes a thousand a month, the other one makes two thousand a month. Now that was my puzzling question. Why would this long list be the same and the money twice as much? I asked, what's the difference between a thousand a month and two thousand a month? Why would one person do twice as well, three times as well? Speaking economically, now I know there's more than one way to do well. I understand that. But in this little narrow area called compensation, what's the difference? Well, back then, with my faulty thinking, I'm trying to reason it out. I thought, well, maybe time makes some of the difference, right? Some people do better because they have more time. I used to say, Harold ought to be able to do well. He's got a lot of time. If I had all of Harold's time, I could do well. Now that's got to be dumb, right? Number one, you can't get somebody else's time. A guy says to me one time, he says, you know, if I had some extra time, I could make some extra money. I said, then forget it. There isn't any extra time. Hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that about wraps it up, right? I mean, you can look around the gongs there for a little more, but it's over. Now, if you can't get more time, which you can't, what could you get more of that would make a difference in economic results? And here's the key word. Make it a part of your notes. We're gonna consider it tonight. The word is value. And I have a little phrase for your notes. Value makes the difference in results. Value makes the difference. You can't get more time, but you can create more value. Now here's the first lesson of economics. Everybody should learn it from the time they're old enough to understand what a dollar means, how to earn one, how to get one, how to keep one, what to do with it. First lesson of economics, we primarily get paid for value. That's lesson one. Bringing value to the marketplace, that's how you get paid. You don't get paid for the time. I know it takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but you get paid for the value, not the time. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the evening. Is it possible to become twice as valuable at the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Could you become three times as valuable? Make three times as much money in the same time. Is that possible? The answer is yes, if. And it's always if, right? Life is known as the big if. Harry Truman once said, life is iffy. How true. And here's the big if we're gonna consider it tonight. It's possible to do much better at the marketplace if you go to work primarily on yourself. And that's the theme of our seminar tonight. Learning to work primarily on yourself. People have asked me for the last 24 years, how do you develop an above average income? And the answer is become an above average person. Develop an above average handshake. Some people want to be successful. They don't even work on their handshake. As easy as that would be to start on. They let it slide. They don't understand. Develop an above average smile. Develop an above average excitement. Develop an above average interest in other people. Develop an above average intensity to win. See, that'll change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above average job with above average pay without becoming an above average person. It's called frustration.
And Mr. Shelf gave me probably the greatest clue he gave me when I first met him. He said, Jim, if you want to be wealthy and happy the rest of your life, just learn this lesson well. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. That's the thing. Success and failure are generally slow processes. Either slowly building things up or gradually tearing them down. And that's why I say you've got to pay attention. You have to watch. You have to watch every single second. Choose love. And don't ever let fear turn you against your playful heart. I believe in uh, manifestation. I believe in uh, putting a rocket of desire out into the universe. And, and you get it when you believe it. You get it when you believe you have it. And that's the key. Is we want to get really sensitized, acutely sensitized, sensory acuity, to whether what we're doing is working or not. And by the way, sensory acuity is really the measure of a person's intelligence. What I mean by that is how do we measure intelligence? Intelligence is a measure of the number and quality of distinctions you have in a given situation. You can handle this, you just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right, this is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. You can do this, other people have done it, it doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. All my life, I wanted to be on TV. Had never heard of a comedy club. October the 8th, I walked into Hilarity's Comedy Club in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. It's right outside there. I signed up for the following week because I just wanted to see what the comedians did. Man, I wanted, I saw stand, live stand-up for the first time. They had 10 acts supposed to go up, nine of them went up, the 10th guy got scared and went and ran out the door. So I had signed up for the following week. The guy says, listen, we lost our 10th act. We're gonna go to the phones. We're gonna go to the week from next week. If Steve Harvey's here, come on up now. So I ran up on stage, I'm doing, I don't even know what to do, but I just started talking about boxing and stuff that happened to me. Audience was hollering, laughing. They brought all 10 of us back up on stage. They had a clap off. I won the clap off. I won $50. I cried from Cuyahoga Falls to Cleveland. The girl kept saying, why are you crying? It ain't with $50. I said, no, you don't understand. It's way more than 50 This is what I do. She said, what you mean this is what you do? This just your first time. Oh, you don't understand. Something happened to me. I won't ever tonight. I went to work the next day, October 9th, 1985, and quit my job. Now, I don't recommend that you do it that way. Because two years later, I was homeless. <laughs> because the first year of comedy, I made $3,400. The next year, I made $4,800 third year I made $5,300. I got a wife, a set of twins. I'm sending every dollar I got to them. So I tried to live on $50, $75 a week gas for 38 cents a gallon back then. I just stayed in my car. So I lived in my car for three years. Three years I lived in my car. And what happened was I just said, man, so I used to fish all the time to eat because I'm a fisherman, I'm a bass fisherman. So I used to stop at lakes and ponds and just fish. And every night, every month, I get run off from somebody's land. Hey, get away from here. Hey, move along, that's not yours. Hey, stop fishing here. I just get run off. And he didn't understand. And one time I had fish on the line. They said, you got fish on that line? I said, yeah, throw them back. I had to throw them back because I used to stop in rest areas with them little cast iron grills. I kept charcoal in my car. I started firing. I eat fish. There's some days I wouldn't eat. So that they thought I was just fishing, but I was eating. So I said one day, I said, man, you know what? One day, man, 
I'm gonna I'm I'm give myself some land. I'm, I'm by myself a piece of dirt. So fast forward, God bless me. I get on TV when I'm 38. I'm on Showtime at the Apollo. Lord have mercy. They gave me my money. I saved my money up. I saved $250,000. I said, I'm going to give me some land. I went to Texas and I'm about to buy some land. But before I went to buy the land, I was curious. I just had the thought. I said, man, I wonder how much land is on earth? How, how many acres is on earth? Because you know, it's not going to change. You know, God lets you fly. God lets you dive on the water. God don't let you make dirt. You can't make dirt. So I looked it up. It's roughly over, just a little bit over, 36 billion acres of land. 36 billion acres of land. So I just got a little bit more curious. And I said, well, how many people on earth? I looked it up. And it was about 6 billion people on earth. So I did some Steve Harvey thinking. I said, okay, if it's 36 billion acres of land and it's about 6 billion people on earth, everybody ought to have 6 acres of land. Not just me, you know, I just, just think. So I asked God, could I have 6 acres? That's all I want. Because you know the one thing I wanted? I didn't care if I put a house on it or nothing. I just wanted to be a stand somewhere and couldn't nobody run me off. Got this money, man. I saved the money. I saved two hundred fifty thousand. I'm going and I'm looking for some land. The first day I get there, I see a piece of land in Texas, so beautiful. I couldn't believe it. it had rolling hills, had a pond on it, where I could fish. A dude took me over there. I look at the land, and I'm and I'm looking. I said, man, this is great right here. I said, sir, how much is this right here? He said, well, it's about six hundred thousand dollars. Man, I ain't, I ain't got that kind of money. He said, well, how much do you have? I said, I got 250000 I said, well, let me think about it. He said, let me think about it. And I was standing there, and then I stopped and said, sir, can I ask you a question, man? How many acres of land is there? He said, this is six acres. Six. Six years ago, I just asked God, just give me six. See, I didn't want a whole lot of acres. I just wanted my cup. Just give me my six. And so I said, ain't this crazy? So I thought about it. I said, man, what can we work out? Right before I got ready to say it, the guy that took me over there said, Steve, let me show you something right quick. He took me over this hillbilly's house. Took me over this hillbilly house named Jerry Campbell. I was a little nervous about meeting him, man, because I ain't like the way he talked, but mess around turned out to be one of the finest men I ever met in my life. Became a father figure to me. Old white man. He took me to his house. He said, let me show you something. He took me over and showed me this land, and it was massive. It had three lakes on it. It had rolling hills, it had trees. It was unbelievable, man. I said, man, this is incredible. I said, man, how much is this? He said, this 16 acres. I said, hey, man, I ain't got that kind of money. Let me go back over here to this dude where I can, Mike can cut a deal. He said, let me ask you something. What was you gonna give that man over there? I said, well, I hadn't worked it out yet because all I got is $250,000. He said, well, listen, I'm in a little bit of a tie right now. And if you can bring me 250,000 cash by tomorrow, I give you this 16 acres. Next thing you know, I had 270 acres of land. Now, let me tell you something. I'm so busy now, I don't even get to go to that ranch. I never can go. And I thought I was going to be fishing and save it for my kids rest of life. God had no plan for me. That's the ranch that I have my mentoring camp on. I bring a thousand black boys out there with a thousand single mothers. And that was the purpose of that ranch. 
I never go there to fish at all. But see, that's what I wanted. I thought that's what it was for. But God got another plan. His way is way bigger than yours. You can't even see his way. But you gotta start to hustle. You gotta give God something to work with. Look, if you start hustling and grinding, he'll fill it up for you. But if you ain't got no hustling, no grind, he can't fill it up. So guess what? I don't ever go there to use that land for fishing or not. But I'm changing boys' lives over there. My story is really a story about faith. It really is. I come out the dirt. I have no college degree. All of my children do. I got seven kids. I said their last one of them. I got three boys, two boys come out of Mo House. I got a daughter that come out of Spelman in Berkeley. I got two daughters went to Hampton. And I got did, and then graduated from Ohio State. I made sure all my kids went to college because I know they got to have that education. But Daddy, you didn't go to college, but your ass ain't got no jokes. It's been important for me to empower my children, and not only my children, but thousands of young people across the country. And education is the key for a lot of people. But when I speak in colleges and stuff, I tell them, the number one thing in the world is not your education. Your dream. So what you dreaming about, child? What you still dreaming? What is God still showing you in your imagination? What are you so afraid of? Why would you not take that leap and go for it before you mess around with that? Why would you not go and see what God really got for you before you leave this world? Why would you hang on to a job? Here's what happens with the job. If you live in paycheck to paycheck right now, when you retire, they're going to give you one third of what you can't live on now. They're going to give you a gold watch and a turkey, and they're going to set you on out to pasture. If I was you, before I leave this world, I'd go see what God really got for me. Just take a chance. Now here's why you should take the chance. Name me one time God has not pulled you through. Just name it. Name the one thing God has never pulled you through. If he ain't pulled you through it, he's currently pulling you through it right now. And the reason I know I'm telling the truth is because you're sitting in here. If God was through with you, he wouldn't wake you up no more. When he wakes you up, it's because he ain't through with you yet. He got something else for you. So why don't you go see what that is? Why we got to live our lives like we owe them something? Man, you owe yourself something. Go be free. Go see what God got for you. Oh, Steve, that's easy for you to say you rich. Hell, did you hear me? I lived in a car for three years. I took On oh, October 8th, I won $50. October 9th, I quit. How big a jump you want to take? You ain't even got to do that. A lot of y'all got savings. You may not have three years up, but you only need a little bit. Just jump. Go see what God got for you. Quit sitting here in your life posturing like it's okay. Quit funking the fake. Quit faking the funk. Quit, quit, quit got people thinking you something you ain't, man, when you really know you won't be something. I'm just telling you just like it is. You ain't got to believe me, but you can look at me. I'm telling you, it's proof in this here now that the God you serve really will give you what you ask for. He will. I'm not your preacher. I'm a hood dude that to mess around with no education, to mess around, got to the top of the TV world, balling out of control. And I'm telling you, I was homeless and lived in a car. And I ain't got no education. Now, y'all in here got degrees. I see it on your forehead. I see it on you. I feel when I'm around educated people. I know you know how to study it. And man, I, I can look at you, and I'm so proud of you. But hey, man, the next level. The man without a dream or vision shall perish. It never mentions if you don't have an education. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. 
If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket, nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my self. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think about it. And start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do, on your job. Work hard on yourself and develop the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces. All of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. If you just go to work on the right thing. Not get things out there to change. Don't try to change the seed. Don't change the soil. Don't change the sunshine, don't change the rain, don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy, work on your attitude, work on your personality, work on your language, work on the gift of communication, work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. Incredible. Success is something you attract, not something you pursue. Success is looking for a good place to stay. So instead of going after it, you work on yourself, personal development. See, the major question to ask on the job is not what are you getting? The major question to ask on the job is what are you becoming? See, the big question is not what am I getting paid here? The big question is what am I becoming here? Because true happiness is not contained in what you get. Happiness is contained in what you become.